afternoon. I'd like to welcome you to the second in a series of noon lectures this quarter sponsored by the Associated Student Speakers Program. Directly following today's lecture, we'll move up to the Women's Lounge for an informal coffee hour question and answer period. Today's uh, guest to UCLA is a self-turned professional radical. Since the late 1930s, he has been all over the country organizing poor communities at their invitation to power blocks capable of winning for themselves freedom and equality in work, education, and living conditions. It has been said of him that no one in the U.S. has proposed a course of action or philosophy better calculated to rescue Negro or white slum dwellers from their poverty or degradation. It gives me great pleasure at this time to introduce Mr. Saul Alinsky. There's water underneath here. There's water. There's water underneath here. Are you a small town? Small town. Is it a nice town? What would you like to have me talk about? I've been given a green light here where apparently I can uh, do this instead of giving you a, uh, a title and starting to talk about uh, any one particular subject. If, you, uh, if I don't like what you're suggesting, I'll talk about what I want to talk about anyway. All right, what would you like? All right, what would you like? All right, what, what about you? <laughs> That's a very depressing question. Right? I'll tell you why it is, because every time I come to Southern California, I start off very depressed, you know. Whether I take off out of Kennedy or out of Logan at Boston, and suddenly I'm hit with the thought that my God, if he only goes east instead of west, we'll wind up in Paris. We got enough fuel aboard instead of coming to Los Angeles, you know. And on top of that, being in that kind of a depression, you have to come up with that question. What's the uh, next one? All right, working in white middle class. What's yours? All right, what's your, anybody else? What's yours? No. No. It's a very basic question. There's a big, well, I'll... Um, all right, I'll tell you what, then. Let me, uh, let me uh, make a general statement, because uh, I should have known that the moment you give me a series of specifics and then start tying into the specifics where I can. And also, uh, let me uh, grape shoot around with, uh, that's a bad word to use, <laughs> buckshot around in California, with, uh, comments on your, uh, on some of your questions. I'll start off with certain specific little comments on the side. One, the role of a white organizer in a black community, he has no role. Uh, we were in probably the only exceptions, I would say, in the country. We were in black or communities. I'm speaking of the south side of Chicago. Rochester, New York, Buffalo, New York, and so on. But when we went in, we went in on the mass invitation of the total community, the kind of a situation which no organizer, white or black, had before them. When we went into Rochester, we went in as a result 
of an invitation from every church in the community, every teenage gang, every civil rights group, every, every group, including more than 13,000 individual signatures on petitions out of a total population in that particular ghetto of 30,000. If you take the kids off the total figure of population, you would, you would uh, be pretty close to saying that every black living there had signed a petition requesting that we come in to help an organization. Now, on that basis, it doesn't matter whether the organizers going in are white, black, polka dotted, or purple. And on that basis, when you ask the question, when no one can ask you the question as to what you're doing here, what is your angle, why you're here, which is a question that an organizer in every situation always has to confront. Because one of the first things you have to do is to have, let me say, your, uh, your license for operation. In other words, what is your reason for being there, and is it an acceptable reason to the community? Will they buy it? Now here, in this kind of a situation, no one could ask us the question because we were there, because everybody had asked us there. We were there more legitimately than any organization that was in the community was there, because nobody had ever come up with a mass invitation like that for any of the others. In Buffalo, the situation was even more so, because after Rochester, we were not going to continue on this in the black ghetto organization. But in Buffalo, uh, we ha ran into a situation not only of the kind of mass invitation that I've described to you, but also for the first time the black middle class joining in with the ghetto in, in actual funding of the operation as well as public identification. But the reason why I have said to you that no one, no white has any business in there And after everything I've told you, that includes us, is because there are certain things in life, such as the fight for equality, that people must do themselves. There is a certain uh, point, a point at which, call it a confrontation occurs, with power, of course. And at that point, when you s are literally saying, I, I am your equal or else, it is at that point that something happens inside of you that you really become equal. And this is a kind of a thing that people must do themselves. Uh, we, even in our training institute, which we're opening in two weeks, those blacks that will be going out to organize, be trained to organize, they will go out under their own banners. There won't be any relationship with us. There will be no more relationship with us than you will have with UCLA after you leave it or that I have with my alma mater, except your relationship with your alma mater will not be as hostile as mine was with mine. Now. This uh, really opens the door into another question on the middle class. And that is that today, many of you who have been involved in the civil rights movement in the past have heard uh, uh, many blacks saying to you, look, Whitey, thanks for everything in the past. Get lost. Go do your thing among your own people. Well, those particular black militants that are telling you that have no idea of the depth of political realism and sagacity of what they're saying, far more than, what to, than the reasons for which they have said this. 
as one who has uh, devoted everything in organization, a mass organization of the poor, and don't say community organization to me when the question was asked about uh, new procedures in community organization, because community organization has always been sort of a farcical, homogenized, sterile, impotent little operation of delinquency programs and settlement houses and uh, supervised recreation and uh, this mystical thing called character building, whatever the hell it is. I've never been able to find out what it is. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, and when uh, in our organization, uh, when people have come up and, and have said CO, to us CO only means conscientious objector. And when they say community org, all it does is evoke a huge Freudian fantasy to us. That uh, uh, we know that for years, uh, before all of the uh, public attention came upon us, that uh, uh, whenever we used to use the term community organization as protective coloration, when we would go into a situation and the establishment the power structure, or whatever you want to call it, because we're always pressed for time in our organization, we simply refer to it as the enemy, that when they would start sending down queries as to what we were up to, we would always respond by saying community organization, and everybody would give a, heave, a sigh of relief, you know, and they'd figure, well, that's that crap, you know. And they were right. But, there are, but in terms of mass organization, there's, there are certain shifts Yes, and thinking that I'll talk to you about in a moment on the, your question. But coming back to go do your own thing, on the political realities of what we are faced with today, keep in mind this, that this nation is the first country, first society, as far as I know in the history of Western civilization, which has emerged heavily, predominantly, preponderantly middle class. I am not accepting the figures uh, that were out about five or six days ago out of HEW, which had poverty down to about 14 percent, but there isn't much question from anyone that at least, at least 80 percent of the American population is today middle class. Now, what this means should be obvious, but I'll labor it for a moment. It means that if you get all the black ghettos of America organized in black power, if you get all the Mexican-Americans in, in America organized, if you get all the Puerto Rican communities organized, if you get all the Appalachian whites organized, and then through some genius of organization you were able to affect an overall coalition, it's still would be a minority group, it still would be lacking in power for substantial significant changes. And as a small group of that size, it would have to do what all small nations, all small organizations, all small everything has had to do in the past, seek allies. And the only place where there can be allies in our society is in the surrounding middle class scene. Now keep in mind when I'm saying middle class, I'm using it strictly on an economic basis because the kind of thinking, the kind of reaction, etc., that goes on in different sectors of the middle class, from the lower middle class to the group above it, is quite different. But it is here that attention must be focused. Now, I'm pausing at this point to go over to the 1984 question. Keep in mind, too, outside of any purpose of allies, etc., that as long as you have four-fifths of America's population feeling completely left out, withdrawing themselves so that you have a huge state of social schizophrenia, where they are not 
uh, desiring to be involved. As a matter of fact, uh, uh, they're out of it. They're bewildered. They're scared. They're lost. They've forgotten where they came from. They don't know where they're at. They're scared as hell of what's coming ahead. Uh, the things that they uh, thought were real on, uh, turned out not to be so. They thought that if they could make it out to that suburb, if they could get that split level and that color TV and those two cars and uh, maybe a country club membership or something, they had it made. And particularly with enough money to at least partly pay their kids' ways through college. So they made it out there and they found that they didn't have it. Many of them found that they'd lost their kids, that the kids weren't talking to them. They, uh, they can't believe or understand what's going around in this world around them. Uh, they feel voiceless, powerless, but above all, lost. Remember this, in certain ways even more lost and even more frustrated than many of the poor, because the poor at least still have a guideline going up there to make that, make all those good things that they have out there. And no one can tell anyone who hasn't experienced it that they're not that good. And you just don't, you, you don't, uh, well, you really don't even try. Some of my student activists that I'm so devoted to do try. They still haven't learned the lesson of living in the world as it is. They still talk about values, which are very desirable. But uh, that's something we may discuss some, uh, later on in discussion. But let me just say this. There's a vast difference between driving for revelations instead of revolution. Now, unless, these, unless you can break through the kind of uh, depersonalization which has settled down over the large masses of our citizenry, unless they can find themselves, instead of uh, feeling like floating a flotsam in a whole sea of, uh, of anonymity, and that there's nothing they can do about anything, unless we can do that, we are truly lost into 1984. Oh, uh, We'll still have a lot of the words, we'll still have the tunes, but the human spirit itself would just become a decayed piece of programmed data in the bowels of some computer, and the computer would be playing the Star Spangled Banner or something, but we'd be gone. We're pretty close to it in many quarters right now. We've lost a, a good part of our uh, free society and uh, are going more and more egalitarian. Now, moving from there over to the area on changes as far as, as organization, there are many changes. One change, certainly, and a change that we've, or we went through as far back as 15 years ago, except when we found ourselves in organization of black ghettos, we had to sort of move back on it. One change is when you talk about community in a modern, urbanized, regional form of society that we're living in, it becomes sheer idiocy to think in terms of physical communities. You think in terms of a community of interest, not the physical community. All you have to do is when, you're, when you go out for dinner sometime and there's any kind of a social engagement, check out where all the people, your friends, live. They don't live right across the street of you. They don't live right within your... Well, all you got to do is, get, is, is watch them get in their cars and head all, off. They're going all over. And in this society of Oz, fluid as it now is, and wide open, and constantly changing, and the, the, that speed of change and the degree of fluidity will be ever increasing, so that it'll make even McLuhan's general ideas as to what's happening to our societies as a consequence of mass media 
look a little bit static. But here you must think in terms of, of, of interest and a very fluid and flexible kind of organization. Now the only reason why, uh, or the only exception to it, let me put it, is when, you, when we were involved in organizing black communities because, because of the segregated restrictive practices of white society, blacks were restricted and segregated into, commu into physical communities so that here you had a situation of a coinciding of interests and physical residence. But this does not apply, certainly not in middle class society. Now, in middle class society, and I'm just throwing out comments on this, there are going to be a number of differences as far as approaches. There are certain basic universal concepts of mass organization that are applicable to all people, whether you're organizing Eskimos or the San Fernando Valley or the south side of Chicago or wherever you're going. But then there are these differences. And specifically, some of these differences, uh, well, let's say one of the things in middle class is uh, you have these cultural hang-ups. Middle class uh, kids are generally brought up uh, with a culture, for example, which avoids rudeness. You know, you have a dinner guest over at your house and the guy is, uh, is uh, fresh out of the John Birch Society or some other wacky operation like that. And uh, he makes some statement which is miles out out to sea, and instead of saying to him, you know, or saying to whoever invited him over, my God, what, from under what rock did you dig that out from? Uh, your response is, uh, well, I don't think that, uh, that uh, everybody would agree with that point of view, you know. <laughs> now, since organization involves action, Organization is action. As a matter of fact, an organization dies rapidly without action. Action is to an organization what oxygen is to an individual. The minute you find that you're sitting around uh, dialoguing, as you might call it, or meeting and discussing and so forth, uh, and the minute you're really involved in all kinds of participatory stuff, uh, you're dead. The only, the, the only thing is nobody's come around to tell you that, you know. But when you're talking about viability, that means you ain't got it. I'm going to put it that way to you. Now, all action happens to be rude. There is no such thing as polite, refined, cultured action. And so you run into that kind of a hang-up with middle-class people which requires certain special skills of communication and operation and breaking through on. Let me give you a couple of examples on just what I mean by that. Uh, about uh, three or four months ago, I was on a nonstop out of San Fran and the Kennedy and ran into this heavy uh, air traffic tie-up that I'm sure you've read about of taking place out there. Consequence being, instead of touching down at 620, we didn't get down until about 950. Now, the significance of that was simply that this was a luncheon flight. Because we were doing a 620, and we had lunch about 1 o'clock or 2 on the plane. Every flight coming in from Los Angeles, from Seattle, and other western uh, towns were in the same, uh, the same scene. So what you had was a mass of people barreling down from the airport into town that hadn't eaten since 2 o'clock that afternoon, and it was about 11 o'clock at night at this point. The hotels were aware of this, and they kept their dining rooms open. Uh, otherwise, you'd have to, you know, go moseying down 6th Avenue looking for some all-night open joint. Now, the hotels had had uh, sold out all their major entrees and they were doing mostly short orders. 
And I found myself sitting at a uh, table eating a grilled cheese sandwich, a cup of coffee, and three middle-class couples of various different age grouping alongside of me, and they had all ordered griddle cakes, some with ham, some with bacon, sausage, and so forth. The waitress had brought their order, but she hadn't brought any butter or syrup. And every time she passed by, they would say, uh, waitress, and her answer was, I'll be with you in a minute, you know, and she never came back. And they were just in a state of acute depression, you know, <laughs> griddle cakes were getting colder and colder and beginning to curl up at the edges. And, uh, and they'd gone through a long day of flying, the same thing I'd gone through. And finally, I turned to them and said, do you want me to get your griddle cakes for you? And one of them looked sort of surprised and said, why do you own the hotel? I said, no, I don't own the hotel, but I'll get them for you. Do you want them? I mean, get your butter and syrup? Well, we certainly would appreciate whatever you can do. <laughs> so in a loud voice, it could be heard about halfway across the dining room. I just yelled out to the waitress, I said, you know, hey, you, get off your ass and come on over here with that butter and syrup right now, you know? <laughs> well, she came, over like a, she came over like a shot with the butter and syrup. But the interesting thing was, and there's the middle class hang-up. Those p couples were so mortified and so embarrassed, they spent all their time apologizing to the waitress that if they had known I was going to do anything like that, you know, they had no association with me, and they kept giving me accusing looks all the time that they were eating their butter and syrup. You get this mental mix-up in middle class, the kind that, uh, well, just a couple of weeks ago in Washington, I found myself uh, after a meeting with a number of newspaper editors in a bar, and uh, which was about the best way we knew of, uh, we were in there for this National Commission on Violence deal, and being in a bar, and uh, we, we all figured it was probably the, the most constructive thing we could do at that point. But the managing editor of the Louisville Courier-Journal uh, was very much interested in what we were doing in this middle class thing. We were talking about middle class uh, mix-ups as far as, as the points of uh, terms of organization. And he said, you know, let me tell you a story to show you just uh, how screwed up this thing is. Then it turns out that his paper, the Louisville Courier-Journal, was the only newspaper in the United States which printed in full, uncensored, the complete government report on my city's uh, hyperthyroid police force. And, uh, you know, all the four-letter words were in it. And the city just reacted with, oh, God, you know, how could anybody do this? Our, our children read the newspapers and look at all these words all over the front page and page two and page three. And from this point on, I'll tell it to you in first person as he was telling it to me. He said, so after all these phone calls and these letters to, to the editor and everybody raising hell about what I had done, I got home for a quiet dinner and my daughter comes in. His daughter turns out to be a senior at a very, well, a very swish private uh, college. And she comes in with, Dad, you know, you never should have done that. There are certain things you just don't do, you know like printing that word all over the paper. You just don't do it. You just don't understand. You don't do those things. Well, then she left the table and went upstairs to get dressed. She was going out on a formal date, and she comes down in her formal dress, and her guy's waiting for her, and he's all dressed up, and they go out the front door. And it just so happened that our dog had unloaded right outside the front door, and she steps right into it, and the first thing I hear from the door is, Oh, shit, I just stepped into the goo-goo. <laughs> now, now this, this is how mixed up it gets, you know? You don't know whether you're coming or going on the thing. But let me suggest this to you on middle-class organization among one of the things that is a tremendous advantage because organization involves not just the issues that are there, 
But one of the things that impels people into it is really a chance to do some living, a chance for the adventure of life, the drama of it, instead of the chronological, just physical, time-consuming existence of what most people endure. Very few people live, because life is an adventure of passion and drama and danger and insecurity with an utter rejection of, of an illusionary security, a realistic one, I would say, because after all, uh, from the moment you're born, you know you're going to die. I don't know wh wherein lies this mystical security. But uh, you do have it on the other side with the people who want to, who are always talking about security and talking about... Uh, well, living a life where they're concerned about their reputations, concerned about this, concerned about that, they never really live. Participation as citizens, acting as citizens, striking out as citizens, uh, provides an opportunity to really come alive, to get turned on. And the frustration that you have in these middle-class suburbs believe me, equals or surpasses much of the frustration that you have in many of the ghettos. And this is, uh, will be a very powerful dynamism in actually getting the action going. Now, how much more time have we got? 51 minutes? Five minutes we go upstairs. Now, what was, what question? I've, I've touched a number of your questions here. What, what question did I not touch at all? What was yours? Oh, you better come upstairs on that. Though. Was there any, any, any other question I missed? What, what was yours? Lower class values? Well, let me put it to you. Let me ask you this way. One of the problems that I have is uh, when I get a question, yes, I do believe that, sure. When I get a question, when somebody will get up, particularly SDS, and say, almost accusingly and tearful because, uh, you know, we have a very warm, friendly relationship we deal with all activists. Uh, when they'll say to me, Mr. Olinsky, do you know what you're, organi what you're doing? You're organizing the poor for what? For these decadent, degenerate, bankrupt, bourgeois, materialistic values. And when I say back, you want to know what the poor of America and the poor of the world want? They want the fatter piece of these decadent, degenerate, bourgeois, bankrupt values. Now, I'm not approving it, but if you are going to organize, you are going, and not just go around doing diaper confrontations, but really organizing for purpose and knowing that until you build an organization, everything else is just revolution of rhetoric. That until you have power, you cannot come to grips with the real issues. Hold it. And every issue, everything you do is designed to build a mass organization. Until that time when you're talking values, it's just like you're in the situation and here's a guy who's starving and he is pleading and demanding bread. So do I turn to him and say, well now wait, let's discuss values for a moment. Do you know that man does not live by bread alone? <laughs> well, you know, uh, it's absurd. And yet, uh, there are many of these absurdities that we constantly 
particularly today, are, uh, are doing. And may I suggest, too, that if you are going ahead and operating with people outside of a, an organizing, outside of cer a certain values, uh, which are general values, that are always up on top of, say, uh, your hierarchy of values. What are these values? They're, they're the basic values that you find in uh, not only in Judaic Christianity, the moral values, but in most religions. They've been, they're the values that have been expressed in practically every revolutionary slogan of, in history, whether they be liberty, fraternity, equality, the French, or bread and peace of the Russians, or no taxation without representation of the Americans, or whatever they may be. They're the values we find in our own Bill of Rights. These values are up on top. The democratic way of life is nothing more than a process, a device, a modus operandi that is designed as the best way, we believe, of achieving those values, of growing into them, so to speak. Now, those values that I have mentioned cannot be discussed, they cannot be argued, they cannot be debated, they are articles of faith. I think George Wallace cut it very accurately at the time when, I don't know whether you know about it out here, but there was a tremendous blow up out through the Midwest when Wallace and I were on a CBS show and he completely blew his cool. He blew his cool so badly that then came 10 days before the Democratic Convention, his radio speech in Birmingham where he gave 10 items what he would do if he were elected president of the United States, and number seven was putting me behind bars for life. <laughs> but I would have hoped to have crossed the, the, uh, the border by that time. But uh, Wallace at one point cut the issue when he said, well, I believe in democracy. You know, I'm not pussyfooting around on it. <laughs> I'm, tell, uh, I'm saying to you that if you believe in democracy, Alinsky, the way you keep talking and what I've been reading about you, then you've got to admit that if I put school segregation on the ballot of Alabama and the majority of the people vote for it, that's a democratic decision. Now, this really cut the issue because from what I've just told you, there are certain values up on top that are not debatable, you can't argue them, and I repeat what I said before, they are articles of faith. My response, of course, to Wallace was, look, you just don't even begin to understand what this is all about in a free and open society. Equality is, a, is one of those values that you cannot discuss or debate, and you cannot put it on the ballot. And if the people of Alabama vote for segregation, if you put it on a ballot to begin with, that in itself would be enough as far as a free society is concerned to tell you to get lost. If you don't accept these top values, then get out of the system, go someplace else. And if the people of Alabama were to vote for it, then this would be a perversion, it would be making a, a whore out of the, out of the democratic process and it would not no longer be democratic. Now, these values and goals are of necessity and stated in general terms. What you don't have any more general terms than equality or justice. But any literate revolutionary knows that you cannot be more than general because all values are relative and are changing. And as and each decade is, is so completely changing that it is impossible to predict. No one 15 years ago could have predicted a computerized cybernetic economy of today or the changes in political alignments or almost anything that happens. And therefore, all objectives must be stated in the most general terms. That's the reason why when you set up a whole constitution, a whole political framework, 
What does a preamble say that this is designed for? Quotes for the general welfare. It couldn't be any more specific than that. This gives you the flexibility of shifting as time shift on it. But there is a certain intrinsic business. You know that equality, no matter how time shift, means being equal, equal, equal. And these, uh, these are the values of a free and open society. I guess it's, I've gone more than five minutes. We're, go we're gonna have to knock off. You've got another question? Come upstairs. Great. Where are they? Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah. Can I just go